So thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Zach Friedman. I work for an institute called Light, and I'm here to talk to you about a study that we did to identify high-impact scientific and technological breakthroughs uh, that are critical for sustainable global development. So to give just a little bit of background uh, as to what Light actually is, uh, so we are the Institute for Globally Transformative Technologies at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. The Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is one of several national research institutes in the United States that are funded by the Department of Energy. It's a large scientifically focused research institution, 3,500 scientists and engineers, $800 million research budget, uh, 13 Nobel laureates associated with it. And interestingly, interestingly uh, all of that research and development is focused entirely on U.S. needs. Light, as a group, was started about three and a half years ago with the express goal of taking that academic horsepower, the IP, the research, the expertise, and looking for opportunities to apply that uh, to address issues in developing countries. So while the vast majority of the institution is focused exclusively on domestic interests, we are focused entirely on developing countries, primarily Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. We have two core beliefs. The first is that populations at the base of the pyramid uh, have a need and a desire for new products that will allow them to live uh, a life of high quality, much as people around the rest of the world do. Uh, and the second is, importantly, that there's a decent amount of research and development that's required to actually build many of these devices and products. Um, and that hasn't been invested currently for a number of reasons from the private sector. Uh, including the high degree of risk in working in these markets, the fact that a lot of major companies simply don't understand what it's like to work in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia. Um, and that's why an important part of our mission is leverage. Again, taking what is being done at the lab currently or at other research institutions around the U.S. and helping apply that to new problems. <clears throat> so the first thing that we did when we started working at the lab was we essentially said, what, what should we be working on? There's almost 4,000 scientists who work at the Berkeley Lab. They work on a wide range of issues, ranging from electricity to material sciences to health. Uh, we could have gone in any different directions, and there was no shortage of interesting ideas that the scientists and the engineers and people from the broader ecosystem were coming to us with. Um, it was important for us to pick high-impact technologies that we could be working on. We wanted to be strategic. And so we launched what, uh, two years later, has come to be known as the 50 Breakthroughs Study. And essentially what we did is we identified nine major issue areas uh, that are commonly associated with international development, global health, agriculture and food security, human rights. Uh, and we said, what are the major problems in each of these areas? So what we tried to do is to start off with a common denominator in each of these areas. So in agriculture, you can say, what is contributing to the loss of yield relative to what it should be? Or in global health, we looked at the disability adjusted life years, which is uh, a way to measure disease burden that essentially says, you know, certain diseases have a high mortality that's associated with them. Some diseases have a low mortality, but they still have a major impact on the life of the individual who has it, such as diabetes, for example. Um, and so this is a way that you can compare different diseases based on the impact that they have in any number of people around the world. And so we said, okay, what are the major diseases that contribute to the loss of uh, positive years of one's life? And you can say it's malaria, it's HIV, it's pneumonia, it's diarrheal disease, it's maternal and neonatal health, it's nutrition. And then we said, okay, what, what underlies these? And if you look at neonatal health, for example, there are three major conditions that contribute the vast majority of neonatal deaths. It's birth asphyxia, preterm birth, and infections. Okay. What underlies those? If you look at infections, there's two major types of infections. There's early onset infections and late onset infections. Um, and these are each caused by somewhat different problems that require a different solution to be addressed. So we took the issues and we tried to unpack them as extensively as we could until we got to core issues. And then we said, how does one address this problem? How does one address the fact that some infants um, are infected during the actual process of being birthed, uh, which then leads to mortality? So we identified the interventions, and then we looked at those interventions, and we said, what are these interventions dependent on? Uh, how important is behavior change in this? How important is a policy change? How important is technology? And then when there was a major technological component, we zeroed in on that, and we said, what is the projected time horizon for this technology? So what are the major challenges in pursuing and achieving this technology? 
And then what are the major barriers preventing that technology from reaching scale, from reaching the large number of people who would benefit from it? And this was our approach, and um, ultimately it was a very problem-oriented process. So we tried very hard not to look at technologies and say, this is important, this is interesting, let's pursue this. We said, what are the big problems, and then which technologies are really critical in helping to solve that problem? Um, <clears throat> Rather than actually talking about the technologies that we came to, uh, I thought I would spend today talking about something different. Uh, if you're interested in the technologies, you can go to the report. It's uh, condensed, concise, 600 pages. Um, but it's divided into subsections, so you can find the areas that interest you or just read the executive summary. Uh, rather, what I thought would be interesting, given the broad array of uh, interests, expertise, the backgrounds of people who are in this room, would be instead to talk about not any specific technologies, but rather what we saw when we were looking across all of these different technologies. Um, in particular, I wanted to highlight seven challenges that we identified uh, facing development and particularly the use of technology in development, uh, talk a little bit about the role of the private sector and also of academia, and then close uh, talking about a couple of the opportunities and some of the more positive trends that we identified. Um, a quick note, uh, my background is personally uh, focused primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, so a lot of my examples will come from Sub-Saharan Africa and there will be a bit more of an uh, angle looking at that. Light as a group focuses on Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, so that's our primary area that we tried to focus on issues from. Uh, and we also place a priority on reaching lowest income individuals. The base of the pyramid can be segmented in a number of ways. Uh, we try to really say who are the people who need these technologies, these breakthroughs the most. And so uh, a couple caveats that might uh, explain some of, the, some of the challenges that we really identified here. <clears throat> so <laughs> the, the first major challenge that was clear very, very early on is that the pipeline for innovation needs strengthening. And this is something that we heard repeatedly as we were talking to funders, as we were talking to practitioners. Um, there are a lot of very interesting and exciting ideas out there. Um, but they tend to be clustered around a certain set of problems. So, for example, uh, one technology that was very popular several years ago is cook stoves. Uh, and this is actually the Berkeley Darfur cook stove. This was invented by one of the founders of Light, a man named Ashok Gadgil. Um, and for a number of years, cook stoves had a lot of attention. Um, Ashok had invented one. A number of other people invented them. Ashok established a testing lab for cook stoves. Hillary Clinton was talking about cook stoves. Everyone wanted to talk about cook stoves. Um, it's been a little bit of time since then. Uh, cook stoves are still important and a lot of people work on them, but they're not quite as sexy as they once were. Uh, now what a lot of people are focusing on are medical devices for uh, infants, and in particular, phototherapy is very prominent. A lot of people are working on uh, this, so phototherapy is for infants who are born with jaundice. It's a very easy to treat condition where essentially if you put them under a specific type of blue light, you can essentially eliminate any risk from jaundice from most infants. Um, one of our funders from the Lemelson Foundation was talking to me early on in the project, and she said, I am up to my eyeballs in applications for phototherapy devices. And it's not a problem per se that a lot of people are working on specific issues, right? It, it's, it's probably a good thing. Right, to have a lot of people who are saying, how can I create the solution in a better way? How can we improve upon this? How can we deliver this to more people? I, I think the challenge is a little more nuanced and what lies under it. And I think what that is, is there are a couple main types of problems that development practitioners really tend to focus on. The first are problems that are the most tractable. The problems that are easy to get our heads around. Uh, women are having to walk very far distances to get biomass to cook with. It's producing a lot of smoke. I'm going to build a better combustion chamber, right? Simple to the point. There's a clear problem. There's a clear solution. There are these treatment devices for infants with jaundice. They cost $20,000. I can make one for $500. Clear, simple, easy idea. Um, the other type of problem that we found people tend to focus around are problems where the solution has a low cost of development, right? So this is particularly common with software. Um, so a lot of people working with the large amounts of data that are being generated, a lot of mobile apps. And again, all of these are good, powerful, exciting technologies. The problem is that development is messy and life is messy and these problems that we're dealing with, uh, some are simple and some are tractable and some can be addressed with software. 
but many problems can't be. And what we found is that there was a lot of attention on certain types of problems and not necessarily a lot of attention on some of the trickier, messier, more complex problems, and those need attention too. Part of what leads to this is a huge gap in funding for research and development between developing countries and developed countries. And this is just a very easy way to look at it. Um, what we have here is a comparison of funding from NIH, the National Institute of Health in the US, uh, on health uh, research and development, and then, so, so just the US on the left side, and then the total combined spend from all other countries on all neglected diseases. So this includes HIV, this includes tuberculosis, this includes trachoma, malaria, um, and there's, there's just no real comparison here. Um, the amount of money that goes into these extremely important diseases that affect a huge number of peoples is just nothing compared to the amount that's spent by an, an influential country, but one country nonetheless. Another way to look at this is to say how much money is spent on these diseases relative to their impact. And so what we did here is essentially we divided the total research spending by the disability adjusted life years. And again, you can see cancer research in the US has an extremely high investment per disability adjusted life year. And all of these other diseases that affect millions of people around the world um, simply don't. And there's, there's really, I think, two things here. One is the amount of money that goes into this research is important, but it's also important to keep in mind that that money builds capacity and the vast majority of research happens in developed countries. Um, and there were a number of people this morning who made the point that the, the best innovators are the people who have the problems. And I think that applies to research as well. Um, we need to be focusing on building research and development capacity in these countries and not trying to import problems and then export solutions back to them. And the current R&D funding system simply doesn't make that possible. A related issue is that if you're a development or if you're an academic who is interested in development, it's much harder to make a career for yourself than it is in any other uh, field within academia. And this is something that's changing somewhat recently. But if you're an academic, your lifeblood is publishing. And for a very long time, and probably up until maybe a decade ago, it was hard to find journals, especially prestigious journals, that were interested in publishing development work. Uh, one of my colleagues actually is a PhD in engineering from Berkeley who's a brilliant woman, she was a physicist beforehand, uh, and she was pursuing her PhD at Berkeley in arsenic remediation, exploring how you can use iron to bond to arsenic to then pull it out of water. Um, and the department essentially said to her, what's the PhD question that you're asking here? Where, where's the PhD level rigor that we require to grant you a PhD? And it took quite a bit of effort from her advisor to actually get the department to grant her a PhD. That was about seven years ago. And things have changed somewhat since then. Uh, but when you're trying to att attract the best and the brightest to deal with these issues that affect a global scale, uh, the fact that it's hard to develop a career as an academic in these spaces is something that's important. Zooming in quite a bit. Hello? Can you, you guys can hear me? OK, great. Um, a problem that we saw again and again and again and again is that new technologies don't fix broken systems. So there's a huge amount of work being done right now on new medical devices, including from within light. But if you look at healthcare systems in developing countries, the spend is anemic, the infrastructure is not there, human capital is incredibly taxed. And so when you take a new technology and you try to plug it into a system that's not working to begin with, you're simply not going to have the type of impact that you want to have that you should be able to have. A related issue that we saw frequently is that as an ecosystem, we're really good at developing technologies for specific problems, right? So we're used to well-functioning systems where there's maybe one major pain point, a couple pain points. You can define that, you can explore it, you can understand it, and you can build a technology that solves that problem, and it fits in very neatly like a puzzle piece. We're not very good at figuring out how to fix systems where there's 10 things that are broken at once. And we still try to apply the same approach. We're going to fix one of these. We're going to fix two of these. But oftentimes, if you're not fixing multiple nodes at once, the system is going to continue to be broken, and you can't have that impact that you're really searching for. Uh, another problem that we saw frequently is that despite the advances that have been made in expansion into servicing the base of the pyramid, the poorest, the lowest income individuals are still extremely hard to reach. Um, and I like the example of pure water purification system, uh, which was developed by Procter & Gamble. 
So this was essentially a water purification system that um, you could take turbid, muddy water with all sorts of uh, pathogens in it, pour this in, wait 15 minutes, it'll clean the water up, it'll purify it for you. Uh, an RCT was done in Guatemala where they found that 40%, there was a 40% reduction in diarrheal disease in families that were using this water purification technology, which is great. Uh, that still held up for children who were under the age of two, which is a really critical period for diarrheal disease because that's when um, uh, children are most prone to stunting. Um, so they launched this, it was great. Procter & Gamble marketed the heck out of it. Uh, it was, you could find pure in about 30% of kiosks in the area of Guatemala that they were looking at. The researchers went back, I think about a year later, and what they found was that only 5% of the families they had targeted were actually using pure water, for, pure water purification system. And of those that were, the average number of sachets that they were using was four. Right? So with this, every time that you draw new water, you, you need to use a new sachet. So essentially, the families weren't using it consistently. Uh, there was actually no increase uh, or no difference between the families who had been provided the service previously in the RCT and those who weren't. Right? So essentially, uh, the families who were exposed to this product were no more likely to buy it than the families who weren't. Um, and this is a compelling example to me because this is, you know, this wasn't, a group of researchers, this wasn't a group of students. This was Procter & Gamble. We all use all of their products all the time. I doubt there's anyone in this room who doesn't have a Procter & Gamble product in their house. These are probably the best people in the world at marketing, and they weren't able to reach the people who they were trying to reach most. We see this not just in products, but also in services. Uh, a study was done in 2011 looking at where women give birth in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as you can see, I think there's about a fourfold increase in the likelihood that someone will give birth at home if they are in the lowest quintile versus the highest quintile. Expanding to problems that are a little broader in scale, um, one of the things that really scares me is climate change. And specifically, I don't really think there's anyone out there who understands what climate change is actually going to look like in Sub-Saharan Africa or in South Asia. Like, we kind of know what it's going to look like. We have these reports. The reports say these really scary things like projected reductions in yield in some countries could be as much as 50%, reductions of income of 90%. Uh, there will be coastal areas will be inundated, consequences for fisheries and tourism, increased flooding. But what does that actually mean? What does it mean when a country's yield drops by 50%? That sounds catastrophic to me. And I think myself and most development practitioners, uh, we're kind of just going about our business, right? We work in vaccination and immunization, and we know this is going to be a problem that's going to continue. We don't have a good sense of what things are going to look like in another 35 years. Um, and I don't think anyone really does yet. And you know, it's something that scares me. And a final kind of high-level issue around things that we don't understand. Um, I don't think we really understand what sustainable development is. How much water is enough? How much water is too much? How much carbon is enough? How much is too much? Um, if we could develop a car that was extremely inexpensive, that would certainly improve the lives of many people around the world, would that be a good thing? How would we decide if that's a good thing? Sub-Saharan Africa is currently 5% uh, of the farmland in Sub-Saharan Africa is, is irrigation fed at the moment. And the climactic patterns are changing dramatically. That amount is going to have to increase. Can we actually do that? Or will that be unsustainable? And I think we don't first have an understanding of what the problem is and what the parameters of that problem are. And we don't have a good framework to say, this is, this is sustainable. This is how we can think about sustainability. I think currently the approach is much more uh, the approach that's taken towards pornography, uh, which is, it's hard to describe what pornography actually is, but we know it when we see it. So, you know, we don't know what sustainability is, but we know when we see a field that's being flooded for irrigation purposes, it's not sustainable. We think when we see one that has drip irrigation, that seems sustainable. We know solar power is sustainable. We know coal is not. Or maybe it is. Maybe a certain amount of coal is sustainable. Um, these are questions that I just don't think we have good answers to at the moment. Um, and this is, this is a real challenge as we try to create sustainable development. Currently, I think most people are either focused on sustainability or they're focused on development. And there needs to be a better collaboration between the two if we're really going to try and achieve this goal that we're setting for ourselves. Um, 
keeping an eye on time, which I'm running out of. Uh, so very quickly, um, the roles of the private sector in academia. Um, so if it's not clear already, I'm a major proponent of the private sector. Uh, a huge amount of money has been put into development over the past few decades. And frankly, I don't think we have a ton to show for it. If you go anywhere in sub-Saharan Africa, if you go to the most rural area, you're always going to be able to buy credit for your cell phone. You're always going to be able to buy a Coke. Um, these are the companies that know how to reach people in the most rural areas. They understand the lowest income individuals the best. Uh, when it comes to distribution and actually getting products into the hands of people who want them, I think the private sector is where you want to go. Certainly, there are many uh, issues that aren't appropriate for the private sector. Education probably isn't. Infrastructure building, probably not. Healthcare, a mix. Um, but I think, broadly speaking, when you're trying to talk about reaching 2 billion people across Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, there needs to be commercial markets in play. Um, academia, I think, is the precursor to that. Um, so we focus a lot on technologies that require research and development. And in most cases, that needs to initiate within academia. Um, so we think of academia primarily as a platform for research, for generating knowledge, for helping us understand what's working and what's not working, and also as a platform to educate, um, so to prepare new professionals to step into that realm. Um, I think there's a bit of a challenge in academia right now where it's trying to understand how much direct impact it's supposed to have. Um, so a lot of schools, such as Berkeley, recently launched a major institute that's all around getting students into the field to um, develop new technologies, to work with local markets. And there's this disconnect between the fact that in a semester, in six months, students can't actually do that much to help people, but it's valuable for the students. And so the school is kind of wrestling with, you know, how much are we trying to emphasize creating impact versus uh, creating students who in the future will create impact? And a related issue is that um, when you are actually out there and you're working much more closely with individuals, you understand the problems better, which is really crucial for researchers. Um, so put another way, academia is kind of on the left here. I think the private sector, and in some cases the public sector, is far on the right. A key issue is that there's this massive gap in the middle, where at a certain point technologies leave the realm of being appropriate for research grants, but they're nowhere near appropriate for commercial funding yet. Um, and this is something that we struggle with as an institute. It's something we've seen uh, many other companies, nonprofits, government agencies struggle with. Uh, and I think this is a real area for impact as funders think about how they can help promote technology around the world. So um, I spent a lot of time talking about problems. I thought it would be good to discuss a few things that are good. Um, there's, there's, there's many things that are good, obviously, but... Um, we're in an academic setting. I figure what's most valuable is to talk about the problems so that people can leave and then go solve them. Um, but a few things that I do think are positive. Um, so this might be controversial and some people might agree with this, but uh, I think it's a good thing that there's an increasing amount of commercial capital that's flowing into these markets and also into development sectors. Um, the amount of money that's available commercially just absolutely dwarfs the amount of money that's available philanthropically. Um, and if you think about this, this is how development really happens, right? It's through investment, um, not through people coming in from the outside and providing unique products. Um, so we've seen a huge increase in commercial interest in developing countries recently, which we see generally as a positive thing. Um, another very exciting element that we've seen is that new technologies are enabling the development of new paradigms. Um, so I was talking to uh, a sanitation <laughs> worker uh, a month and a half ago, and he said, you know, if we redesigned the U.S. sanitation system, we wouldn't do it the same way again. Uh, and we see this across a number of areas. If we redesigned the grid, we would do it differently. If we redesigned our healthcare system, we would do it differently. It used to be that health was about having hospitals, clinics, and then you would have clinic workers go into surrounding areas in what's called outreach. But because we now have passive devices that don't require electricity, um, you don't need to have outreach, you can have an outpost, right? You can leave just a vaccine refrigerator or a vaccine storage device in a village that otherwise would only have someone come maybe once a week, maybe once a month. Um, it's rethinking the way that we can actually deliver products and deliver services. Um, and a final trend opportunity uh, that really excites me personally is that I think our thinking on what development actually means is becoming much more sophisticated. In particular, it's becoming more focused on systems as opposed to products. It was only a few years ago when 
D-Light's uh, solar lantern was the most exciting thing anyone had ever seen before. Uh, it was really low cost, it was, being, it was successful in commercial markets. Uh, but we realized very quickly people don't just want lights, they want many things. And we moved quickly to solar as a service where you can charge your phone, uh, you can power a radio. And I think what we're seeing now is a movement even past that towards appropriate infrastructure. Right? It's no longer saying there's this one problem, I'm going to develop one technology and it is going to address that problem. It's saying there are all of these things that people want and we are going to develop systems that allow them to meet their wants and their desires. It's not saying you need to study at night, so here's a solar lantern that will allow you to do that. Uh, you need to burn less fuel right, and inhale less smoke, so here's a cook stove that will allow you to do that. It's about enabling people to live the lives that they want to and meet their desires, which I think is more or less what any of us want in the world. Um, and I think a very positive direction for the space to be moving in. Um, so with that, thank you.